Welcome to the games, where all Rome is gathered. Welcome to the games, the place of gladiators and beast fighters. For a staggering 700 years, the Romans slaughtered millions of wild and exotic animals in the empire's arenas of death. Men fought ferocious beasts in mortal combat. Criminals were executed by lions, leopards and tigers, hungry for human flesh. For the animal kingdom, there was a heavy price. Some animals were hunted almost to extinction. The bloodlust fueled an industry in the trade of wild beasts, unsurpassed in both history and scale. But the games were not just for show. This film reveals for the first time how the animal games underpinned the rise of the Roman Empire. It shows how ambitious men rose to power, how emperors controlled their people, and how the stability of the Roman peace was built on the blood-soaked profiteering of the Roman games. This is the island of Sicily. Lying at the strategic heart of the Mediterranean, Sicily was the first province of the Roman Empire. Tucked away in the hills lie the ruins of a magnificent villa, a villa that is changing our understanding of the Roman world. Known as Piazza Armorina, it is vast. More than 40 rooms have been excavated and each is decorated with astonishing mosaic floors. Pride of place belongs to the 60 meter long Great Hunt Corridor. This mosaic depicts the capture and transport of wild beasts destined for the arena. It's a remarkable treasure trove for historians, leading to new insights into the workings of the Roman animal trade. But the grandeur of the villa offers more, a unique glimpse into the political ambition of its owner, a man who gave lavish games to celebrate his rise to high office in Rome. And there's a mystery too. We don't know who this man was. An aristocrat and multimillionaire, he returned to Sicily in 325 AD. We shall call him Petronius, and based on the contemporary writings of men like him, we have given him a voice. Piazza Armorina is his spectacular legacy, and this in part is his story. In my 40th year, I was elected consul, the highest public office granted to a citizen of Rome. To repay this honor to my emperor, the city and the people, it was my duty and my pleasure to present three days of games in the arena. Putting on magnificent games as consul or any other magistrate in Rome was a piece of political theater, but it was also an expression of political power. It was indicating your position on the social pecking order. The more magnificent the games, the more credit that would come to you. The first exotic animals known to have been publicly exhibited in Rome was in 275 BC, when four captured elephants were paraded before the crowd. The wonder of seeing new and magnificent creatures from far-flung lands caught the imagination of the people. As the empire expanded into North Africa, more and more exotic animals arrived. And more and more Romans flocked to see displays of creatures they had never seen before. The leopard's spotted neck bore a yoke. Tigers submitted to the whip. Stags chewed on golden bits. Libyan bears were tamed with bridles. And a great boar was gagged with a purple muzzle. That process of conquest is a process of discovery. And as you meet new lands, you meet 
new animals. And bringing back the animals is a source of wonder to the Romans. The first rhinoceros, the first giraffe, it causes amazement. Everyone comes to see it. And they know that this is part of, they've reached a new frontier of empire. Animals were box office, but as more were shown, people came to expect games that were bigger, more exciting and more dangerous. Soon, animals and men were pitted against each other to satisfy the growing appetite of the crowd. Part of it, really, is to see the excitement of hunting. And this will be true when you set one animal against another. There's quite a lot of that. And then, of course, you have uh, human beings hunting animals, and so the audience enjoys that vicariously. It's like hunting yourself. So one of the great things is that it gives the great populace access to what is really an aristocratic sport, what it's like to hunt. The popularity of the animal shows was not lost on Rome's ruling class. In 55 BC, after campaigns in Africa, Armenia, and Egypt, the great general Pompey presented games with a staggering 600 lions, 18 elephants, and a huge variety of animals taken from all over the Roman world. In the seething rivalry of Rome, ambitious men like Pompey and Julius Caesar realized the games could be the key to boosting their political careers. Power and entertainment had become inextricably linked. Caesar had an absolute genius for showmanship, an infallible instinct for what was popular. And he several times nearly bankrupted himself to give the most lavish games imaginable, which delighted the crowds even more. So it really was essential to electoral success that you gave a very lavish set of games. The failure to do so would effectively end your political career. It's an extraordinary thought that the history of the world would be very different if Caesar's games had not brought him electoral success. Caesar's adopted son, the first emperor Augustus, brought Egypt into the empire. He made the province his personal domain and could now tap the rich animal resources of the Nile. There were crocodiles, elephants, and hippos. Augustus now had access to the animal menageries that the Ptolemies had previously uh, possessed in Egypt. So this led to an increasing variety of animals being brought from Egypt. And in addition, Augustus was able to import some of the animal handlers that had previously been active in Alexandria. During his long reign, Augustus presented 26 annual imperial games, each sought to outdo the last. Costs boomed, but so did expectations. His memoir records the scale of the carnage. 3,500 African beasts were slaughtered. The games had become a political imperative. Emperors that followed were hostage to an escalation in scale that is simply hard to grasp. When the Colosseum opened in 80 AD, there were 100 consecutive days of games. On the first day alone, 5,000 beasts were slaughtered in the arena. But for emperors made rich on the booty of conquest, it was a price they were willing to pay. Beast hunts and gladiatorial games clearly have an absolutely central symbolic role. It is the moment at which the emperor can control his crowd, and it is the moment at which he can display that Roman society is an ordered society. That's very important. The Romans had no romantic ideas about the well-being of wild animals. The killing of men and beasts in the arena served to illustrate the power of the emperor and the progress of civilization. It was a visual and visceral political symbol of Roman control. 
I think the real way to look at it is that they don't want to control the populace by the soldiers. They don't want it to look like a police state. They don't want the visitors from the empire thinking that the Roman crowd is held down. They want them to look as a consenting population who are prosperous and happy and who like their emperor. It is no coincidence that the great amphitheaters were the single most visible buildings in a Roman city. Attending the games was one of the practices that defined being Roman. The Romans are very conscious of the fact that from the head spills all these examples of games and spectacles, and they're imitated everywhere. So they know that if they travel, they will find an amphitheater, a circus, in almost every city over the empire. That's what a city is about, and all this is part of what it is to be Roman. Grand Imperial Games were funded by the treasury, but for a patron like Petronius, it was different. He was obliged to give games after being elected consul. They involved a huge private cost and some very real risks. Your games had to exceed the drama and excitement of those of your political rivals. Seneca wrote that everyone was dedicated to entertainment, except those interested in philosophy. How right he was. When you enter the forum, what else do you hear young men talking about? I had now to outdo the reputation earned by the shows of others. The munificence of my house in my consulship pledged me to present nothing mediocre. All the most prestigious games offered lions and other exotic cats. Specially trained for the arena, they were used as aggressors to attack and kill other animals and to fight the professional beast fighters. A patron also needed a supply of condemned criminals. These men and women would be executed by wild beasts as bloodthirsty lunchtime entertainment with a strong moral message for the crowd. The criminal is a wild animal among men. They regarded them as inhuman, bestial, and the best way to punish a man who has become so bestial is to throw him to other beasts. It also is a particularly humiliating form of punishment, and the spectators realize what the power of Rome is and what happens to them if they put a foot wrong. Hosting a consular games could take two years to plan and execute. And to get the star attractions, you had to pay premium prices. Lions were the most expensive beasts to secure, each costing the equivalent of keeping 250 soldiers on full pay for a year. The top quality lion was costing more than anything else. 50% more, for example, than a top quality leopard. And it's quite clear that these were the two animals, probably along with elephants, that really captured the imagination in the eyes of the Roman populace. The games became central to political power and success in Rome. They could alter the fate of emperors and ambitious senators. But bringing thousands of animals across the Roman world was a leviathan task. So just how was it done? The staging of extravagant games in the Roman arena could make or break the career of an aspiring politician. Two years of hard work went into its planning and organization, and the costs involved were vast, the equivalent of several million pounds. People bankrupted themselves to give a successful series of games. You could easily spend the equivalent of what uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger recently spent in running for the governorship of California at least $10 million on a decent set of consular games. The games that the emperors would give would be many times more than that. The patronage of the games was a huge challenge and a great risk. For a man like Petronius, the owner of Piazza Armarina, this undertaking would test his personal resourcefulness as well as his wealth. 
Great lengths were taken to find noble beasts for the spectacle in Rome that would celebrate my consulship. Alps and Apennines were searched. The great boar of the Rhine marshes was captured. Bears were roused from Pyrenean oak woods and caves by the River Tagus. Stags and other non-savage creatures were brought from Corsica and Sicily. From Africa came impala, antelope, and topi. Africa and Egypt were scoured for lions and leopards, and if not for elephants, then for the ivory, for tablets that would bear the name of Petronius as consul. Every magistrate would try and outdo his predecessor, and it would be a test, it would be a challenge for him of just how many contacts he had around the Roman Empire. We have letters, of course, of people writing to their friends and saying, there you are out there, and you're in a very good position to ship me some leopards. I really have to have these leopards, and I have to have them by a certain date. And the man at the other end is thinking, oh, this is a real headache. So I have to have these hunted, and then I have to have them shipped, and I have to have them fed, um, but he'll do something for me in return. For the first and last time in history, an empire encircled the whole of the Mediterranean. A common currency was used and an official language spoken. In these conditions, the animal trade flourished. The variety of animals, the variety of entertainments depend on control of the seas. There's no way you can ship animals to Rome for your games if the ships are going to be intercepted by pirates. So it is absolutely necessary for trade to have that peace. Of course, they didn't pacify the Mediterranean in order to have games, but the games reflected the pacification of the Mediterranean. In the long years of the Roman peace, the help of provincial governors was important but it wasn't the only way to source animals. Emperors and patrons with imperial permission made good use of the army. And that's something we can also see at Piazza Ramarina, because the aged man with the flat top beret in the Great Hunt Corridor is undoubtedly a soldier directing the capture of beasts in the eastern half of the Roman Empire. There's even some mention in the sources, uh, for example, Julius Africanus, who writes that capturing animals is a primary way in which uh, Roman soldiers can keep up uh, their fighting skills. It's a good military exercise, if you like, to go out and capture animals uh, like lions. Some legionaries gained reputations as specialist hunters. We hear, for example, of soldiers who describe themselves as ursarii, which must mean bear hunters. And this isn't bear hunters just for the local amphitheatres. This isn't bear hunters just for the amusement of the legion off duty. This is supplying of beasts for further afield. And we even have an inscription from Cologne, for example, which talks about 50 bears being netted in six months, which is obviously something to boast about. Great and daring men, some dressed in sheepskin with shields covered in oxhide, would exhaust the lion by constantly diverting its attention from one hunter to another until, worn out, the beast would fall and be bound. What a feat. They bore off this great monster like a tame sheep. The huge demand for animals was making men rich. In North Africa, shrewd private traders engaged thousands of slaves, tribesmen and hunters to trap the wild beasts. The capturing of wild animals was a skill in itself. There were people that assembled wild animals, mainly in North African camps, where local people caught wild beasts, and they employed the sort of the old-fashioned pit systems, covering them with branches and twigs, um, and the animals fell in the pits. Also baited cages with sliding trap doors. And of course, chasing them into big corrals. This booming industry 
now linked the great aristocratic households of Rome to agents, entrepreneurs, army units and private hunters in the farthest reaches of the empire. The trade pumped cash to the provinces, redistributing enormous wealth from Rome. I'm sure that the beast hunts are one, but one among many elements in stimulating the Roman economy. But the beasts play their part, and because it's so politically important, it means that you're opening up lines of communication to some really quite far-off places and bringing them into the economic network. The treasures being revealed at Piazza Armarina have given us unique insights not only about the variety of captured animals, but also how far they traveled. The Great Hunt Corridor spells out the astonishing story of how animals came from the far corners of the Roman world and beyond. On the left-hand side are lions and leopards from Africa. On the right are wild beasts from the east. We've got animals, for example, like tigers that came from Armenia, hippopotamuses and rhinos. There's a one-horned rhino which came from India. And in the center of the floor, there are a pair of soldiers who are receiving the beasts on their arrival in Italy prior to their being shown in the Colosseum. Now, the message that the owner at Piazza Armarina is trying to get across is, I have scoured the length and breadth of the Roman Empire for beasts. I have brought them from what are in effect, in ancient terms, the ends of the earth. Captured animals were regularly transported hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles. The dangerous big carnivores were carried in wood and metal crates pulled by oxen or mules. These crates were largely enclosed, keeping the animals in the dark. While this kept them much quieter, the stress of confinement was immense. Huge losses were inevitable. I would have estimated 50% of the total consignment would have died before it actually reached Rome. Just feeding and watering the animals on their journey to the Mediterranean was an enormous task. Now, an elephant eats three bales of hay a day, 25 kilos of concentrated dry food, 25 kilos of fruit and vegetables, and drinks 200 litres of water. An elephant has to continually eat because it can only actually digest 44% of the food it consumes. So can you imagine that providing, say, nine, 10, sometimes 20 elephants, how much effort and time and money it would have taken to actually get those animals there? From across Africa, Egypt and the Middle East, the animals would arrive at the key trading ports of the Mediterranean. Antioch, Alexandria, Cyrene, Lepkis Magna, and Carthage. Not all the animals were destined for Rome. These great cities also became famous for their own animal shows, and they built great arenas to rival the Colosseum. The magnificent El Gem in Tunisia was one of 10 arenas that held over 30,000 people. At these busy Mediterranean ports, the animals were rested and stored in vast depots before the final stage of their journey. The agent would have then got all those animals assembled in his camp. It took such a long time. The animals could have waited there sometimes up to a year. And during that period, they would have had animal trainers there preparing them, conditioning them for Rome where they would have started teaching them to eat human flesh, teaching them to attack people, teaching them to fight in the arena. Some cities like Alexandria became renowned for producing high quality animal trainers. Praise to the tamer who put his hand in the lion's mouth, to the keeper who kissed the tiger, and to the Negro dwarf who ordered his elephant to kneel or dance. With a constant throughput of animals, the North African depots thrived. Curious visitors mingled among the traders and trainers. Deals were done, 
beasts sold and sick animals offloaded. Physicians came to observe butchery and dissection. Artists to study animal shape and form. The depots were exotic and exciting. For the patron, a year or more's work and a small fortune had already been spent. But the risks ahead were still high. The animals now faced the gruelling journey by sea to their final destinations, the amphitheatres of Italy and Rome. After months of expense, preparation and training, the final and most hazardous part of the animal's journey began. From the Mediterranean depots, thousands of animals of all shapes and sizes were loaded onto vessels bound for Rome. This was animal transport on an industrial scale. Rhinoceroses and hippopotamuses would have been in vast crates, enormous wooden metal boxes weighing many, many tons and being pushed along by hundreds of slaves on logs to act as rollers and then winched up onto the decks of ships. A ship in those days probably could have only taken maybe four or five elephants. And can you imagine what happens if one took fright and started demolishing the ship halfway to Rome, which I'm sure it happened many times. Delays and shipwrecks were regular setbacks. They could spell political disaster for a patron of the games. There is a very sad letter of Pliny to a friend who tried to give games involving African beasts uh, in Verona, and the animals didn't arrive on time, and the crowd was very disappointed. They got gladiators, but they didn't get their animals. The ship Mosaics at Piazza Armarina present a different story. An intriguing shorthand suggesting this patron was lucky. Shown simultaneously loading and offloading their cargoes, they represent a successfully completed journey. For centuries, millions of animals arrived here at Ostia, the port of ancient Rome. It was the thriving hub for a huge local industry, dedicated to keeping the valuable animals alive and fit for the games. In one of Ostia's prominent squares, there are the telltale remains of the offices of North African traders. In some cases, the mosaic pavements in front of those offices indicated that they had an interest in wild beasts. For example, the Libyan town of Sabratha has an elephant. And we know that in the earlier part of the empire, elephants were still around in North Africa and Libya was one of the areas of supply. As scores of valuable animals arrived in Rome, a patron like Petronius now faced the challenge of where to keep them safe and well in the run-up to the games. The solution to this headache seems to have been large-scale animal parks called Viveria. These were created in the countryside outside the city walls of Rome. You would have your animals coming in piecemeal. Uh, they would not all arrive at the same time, so it was considered more suitable to have these large, what we might call game preserves, where the animals could be kept, and in some cases where, of course, they could recuperate uh, from their journeys to uh, cities like Rome. The largest parks were the Imperial Vivaria. They were the private zoos of the emperors, many of whom liked to keep wild beasts and especially exotic cats. Owning a wild beast, like a lion or an elephant, was a great status symbol, but expensive. Shrewd emperors made gifts of surplus animals, buying loyalty whilst saving money. At the age of nine, in the year 274, I saw my first imperial show. The triumphal procession of Aurelian included 20 elephants, four tigers, giraffe, elk, and 200 tamed animals of different sorts from Africa and Palestine. 
These he distributed after the triumph to private citizens to save the treasury the cost of their keep. With the animals recuperating in the Vivaria, a patron now needed to hire the best hunters and animal fighters he could afford. These men would kill or be killed by the beasts in the arena. Some fighters had no choice. They were slaves or prisoners of war, but the best were professional beast fighters. Trained in schools like gladiators, they fought in teams with their own names and emblems. And like gladiators too, they could rise above their lowly status to become celebrities. Some men were undecided whether to become gladiators or beast fighters. This profession shared both the dishonor and the glamour accorded to gladiators. Men thronged to it, and they prided themselves on bites and scars as beauty marks. Many men fought beasts in the arena for the honor of bravery alone. The status of the performer in the Roman amphitheater is a big paradox. All the performers, whether they're beast fighters or gladiators, are low status. But they are nevertheless low status performers in an incredibly glamorous performance. And they all are trying to display quality, virtue. The beast fighters were housed in special barracks near the Colosseum. Here they exercised, trained for combat and prepared the animals for the arena. They relied on speed and agility. Their favorite weapon was the long spear, which helped to keep them out of the vicious reach of the big cats. Occasionally, women were trained as beast fighters. In the arena, they played the part of Diana, goddess of the hunt. Some were particularly skilled. This presumably would have added some titillation, so to speak, for the audience to see not your run-of-the-mill beast fighter in the arena, but a woman fighting these ferocious animals as well. In North Africa, the beast fighting shows were often more popular than the contests of gladiators. This Tunisian mosaic shows the Telegenii team of beast fighters receiving their fee from the paymaster of a local patron called Megarius. Such was the success of this show that the patron doubled their fee. The rich rewards were only made to beast fighter teams who were skilled in getting the best out of their star attraction, the big cats. The Romans had to teach them to attack humans, and they did this by taunting them with prisoners and thrusting them at the lion or tiger, until eventually a lion or a tiger would grab one of these poor victims, and then, of course, it was all over, and they learned from that. In the final weeks before his games, a patron had to secure criminals for execution and hire gladiators for the afternoon finale. A fortune had been spent, the emperor's favor given, and the political future of the patron now rested on the staging of a memorable set of games. As dawn broke on the day of the games, the excitement of the events ahead began to build. From as early as 6 a.m., the narrow streets filled as the crowd of some 50,000 pushed its way towards the arena. The games occupy a great deal of time in the Roman calendar. It increases in time from the Republic to the Empire, so by the fourth century, we're talking about nearly half the year. So going to Rome and the games and seeing the emperor is a great thing, and they bring ambassadors to it. Representatives of foreign powers get as their treat going to the games. It's not just for the lower classes. In the preceding days and nights, 
Hundreds of terrified beasts were secured in rows of interlocking cages beneath the arena. Cocooned in the subterranean chambers, the final preparations for the show now began. In special guarded areas, the beast fighters made ready. They dressed in short tunics with little protection for their heads or legs. Alongside the long spear, some carried short swords and daggers that were used to dispatch the wounded beasts. They faced the thrill of victory and acclaim or the prospect of mutilation and death. Before entering the arena, each offered prayers to Diana, goddess of the hunt. Above ground, the crowd took their seats. At Imperial Games, the emperor sat in the front row with his family, in the place of honor. The games have become a very important instrument in imperial control. Rome is the showplace of imperial power, and the real importance is symbolical. The emperor has to be seen to be powerful in front of an enormous crowd of people. Senators also had privileged seats. Soldiers were separated from civilians. Married men sat separately from bachelors, boys from their tutors, whilst women were relegated to the very top tier of the amphitheater. People have a right to certain seats. There's a wonderful story about some ambassadors who come in they want to be taken to the games, and when they get there, they see that there are some other representatives who are sitting with the senators, and they don't see why they haven't been given these wonderful seats themselves. So they're very conscious of this kind of ranking. In much the same way that you can tell the career of a politician today by his position to the PM, you could tell the same thing in the amphitheater as to who was on the way up and who was on the way out by his position relative to the imperial box. As the water organ played, the anticipation grew. People gossiped, bet, bought snacks of olives, nuts, and seafood from the attendants. They were entertained by dancers or acrobatic displays. Then the master of ceremonies paid homage to the emperor. The people were welcomed. And finally, the patron had his moment of glory, rising to receive the applause of the crowd. I thus presented my games, a privilege requested from the emperor, of whose honor and liberality I was the minister. It was my moment of immortality. I think everybody likes to keep in the public eye and to be remembered. And of course, if you impress the emperor, then you'll also get a good province. So there are things that come after the consulship. The pinnacle of a senator's career is becoming governor of Africa or Asia. Horns then rang out across the arena. The action began. First on the bill were the animal hunts. Lions and leopards chased and attacked game, giving a display of their power. Next, the ferocious animals were set upon each other. An elephant faced a lion. A bull was chained to a bear. Between these bouts of fighting, exotic and rare creatures were displayed to the cheering crowds. The excitement above masked the titanic task beneath. Unseen to the audience, hundreds of slaves toiled in the chambers below. The smell of drying blood fused with the pungent aroma of wild beasts, sweating with fear. Defiant roars competed with the swelling noise of the crowd, and with an enormous effort of military precision, lions, leopards, and tigers were released towards the blinding light of the arena. Then, facing death or glory, the beast fighters stepped onto the sand.
the Beast Hunters too are facing up to danger and showing their courage and setting a model for the Roman citizen in the audience who needs to learn how to be a good, virtuous, brave citizen. And that's part of the justification of, of the whole thing. But it also means that some beast fighters can become famous performers. He plunged his spear in a charging bear at the peak of its prime. He laid low a lion of such strength and size we might honor him as Hercules. He smote death to a swift leopard with a wound dealt from afar. With such a strong hand and assured stroke did the youth aim his spear. Successful beast fighters became celebrities. We know of one man called Carpophorus, who killed 20 beasts in one show. The scale of the slaughter knew no bounds. In the triumphal games of the Emperor Trajan, scores of beast fighters dispatched a record 11,000 animals. By noon, the beast fighting was over. Hundreds of carcasses were dragged from the arena, but the killing feast had more to come. Served up on the lunchtime menu were the public executions of criminals by wild beasts. Defenseless men and women, tied to stakes, were wheeled into the arena. Then specially trained lions or leopards, fed on human flesh, were released to attack and devour their victims. They had lost the right to call themselves human beings. They had transgressed the laws of civilized society and were outcasts and were demonized and placed at the level of wild beasts and executed by wild beasts as the worst punishment that anyone could imagine. There are some, like Juvenal, who wrote that cruel punishment only teaches others to be cruel. But this virtue in such pain, a show of beautiful wounds and a contempt for death. In the arena, the love of glory and the desire for victory can be seen even among outcasts, slaves, criminals. One of the justifications for the games is that it teaches free men that even slaves can be really brave, so what should you be? Thousands of criminals were slain. Sometimes these executions were dressed up in the macabre staging of ancient myths. One account tells how the story of Orpheus, who tamed the animals with sweet music, was subverted for the games. On Orpheus's stage, every kind of wild beast was present, mingling with the tame. And many a bird hovered above the bard's head. All was calm. Then suddenly, through a trap door, an angry bear was sent to attack Orpheus, who was then torn limb from limb by the ungrateful beast. There's no way you can get away from the bloodlust that is inherent in the games. The bloodshed creates enormous excitement. And of course, that bloodshed is cruelty. At the same time, the Romans aren't sensitized to cruelty or that sort of cruelty in the way we are. They didn't think of themselves as doing something that was incompatible with being civilized, decent, ordered people. For the final afternoon events, the contests of the gladiators took the stage. As they slogged it out inside the arena, Outside, the slain animals were skinned, butchered, and cooked. It was a final gift from the patron to feed the crowds on their way home from his games. We also have animal bones from a fountain just outside the Colosseum. A deposit there has produced lion bones and produced ostrich bones. And one has this lovely picture of people tossing the bones from their barbecue, as it were, over their shoulder as they pass the fountain. Across the Roman Empire, the sheer scale and ambition of the animal games remains unparalleled. 
It's very important to remember, it's not just Rome. It happens locally. There are hundreds of amphitheatres in Italy. There must have been thousands across the Roman world. And at that local level, the wealthy men of the empire invest extraordinary sums in games. From North Africa to the Bavaria, from Bavaria to the arena, this must have involved tens of thousands of people to look after thousands of animals. It was an enormous business. But the animal kingdom paid a huge price. Year in, year out, over decades that stretched to centuries, a 700-year period of hunting, trapping and gaming devastated the animal population of the Roman world. Oh, distant lands of Africa. Your barren plains are no longer visited by wild beasts of prey. You no longer tremble at lions roaring in the desert. For Caesars have caught great numbers of them for the games. And the former lofty lairs of wild beasts and our pastures. Millions of animals died in the trade or were slaughtered in the arena. By the fourth century, one writer commented that there were no more elephants in Libya, nor lions in Thessaly, nor hippopotami in the swamps of the Nile. Thousands of animals would have been collected every year for various events going on throughout the Roman Empire, and these events as well went on for centuries. So certainly the effect of the Roman animal trade on animal populations must have been very significant indeed. Animal ranges shrank as beasts were driven deeper into the wilderness. But for the Romans, the trade created further opportunity. Safe new grounds opened up for agriculture, settlement, and the spread of civilization. And for a successful patron of the animal games, prestige and political high office was guaranteed. The world was your oyster. We have no written record of the games presented by the owner of Piazza Armarina, but perhaps it doesn't matter. The villa is a clear statement of his desire to set in stone his moment of munificence and the glory bestowed on him by the crowd. His display of status and wealth has given us a remarkable window into the untold story of the Roman animal trade, but has also left us with one final irony. What the owner at Piazza Armarina is doing is commemorating for all time so that he can show off to his friends and his hangers-on just what a powerful man he was, just what a successful games he put on while he was holding the magistracy in Rome. So no one visiting him in his villa should be in any doubt at all about the fact that they were coming to see a big noise. But one thing that we don't know is who that man actually was.